Dawn. Let me work backwards for a moment. Most all of you know me as a craftsman and an artist. It is my second adult career. After leaving my rather checkered college years, I became a high school history teacher. My most exciting and demanding work came in directing a program for Native Americans in New England private and public schools. In the 12 years of shepherding these students through the vagaries of Anglo education, we had only one dropout. Over the years, I have stayed in touch with a handful of them and watched them return to their people and work to create better paths, primarily as lawyers, teachers, in various positions in tribal governments. A year and a half ago, Susan and I traveled to the Navajo Nation for a 30-year reunion. It was very moving. However, that life was also killing me. As teacher, counselor, bus driver, banker, stomp dance coordinator, grant writer, coach, dorm master, as well as husband and father, well, as you will see in a moment, I went back to my youth. But first, who is the artist in society? I don't wish to be bogged down by the medieval argument of how many angels can stand on the head of a pin, or who and what is an artist. May we broadly agree that an artist is a person who conceives of a vision and then brings it into the real world. The work may be plebeian, rough, cultured, exquisitely formed, pleasing, or excruciatingly jarring, so much so that the guardians of our morals are forced to hide it from our tender senses. Artists are seers. They hold up their work and force us to question our comfortable world. There is a rich tradition across all our histories of shamans, of seers, of witch doctors, of court jesters and fools, and artists who would hold a mirror for us to look at our society. I don't believe for a minute that my work is in that exalted realm. However, all artists reach toward a slightly different way of seeing and then try to show that vision to you. Here is a glimpse of my journey. On the afternoon of Saturday, May 12, 1934, my mother knew I was on the way down the canal. I was to be the third of her four children. My dad was away, and so the local cab was called, and seeing my mother's delicate condition, began to crawl towards the Boston Lying In Hospital. My mother... Stop the cab, get out, and switch places. If we drive at this rate, we'll never get there. And faced with forms in triplicate at the hospital, my mother sweetly inquired where they would like the baby born, in this office or the delivery room. I arrived soon thereafter. Fourteen months later, my sister, Tony, arrived. We had been conceived seven years after my brother and an older sister in an attempt to hold this marriage together. It didn't work. So there we were, two and three, failing at our first major job. I can't speak for Tony, but I think it was the saving of me. If I had grown to adulthood in Boston as a scion of this lesser Brahmin family, I would have become a fiduciary lawyer, a player in the financial world of the State Street Bank. God help them and me. Instead, we were left to the loving and tender mercies of a nanny, while my mother and her new husband went to tour Europe for six months. What was she thinking? The entry in her diary upon her return was, Glad to be home. Nal needs the strong hand of his mother. Thus, we were removed from the world of butterballs, of dressing for dinner, of the upstairs maid, to the hills of northwestern Connecticut and plunked down on a small, mostly wooded, scrabbly farm on a dirt road, where my earliest memory was being scrubbed with yellow soap and a hand brush in a spring-fed cauldron behind the barn. This was definitely not Boston. As hard as the move was, small children are resilient, and as hard as our stepfather was, not wicked, but hard, I eventually blossomed. 
My parents created an environment of interesting and later awe-inspiring friends, including Sandy and Louisa Calder, Malcolm and Muriel Cowley, Peter and Evie Bloom, Van White Brooks, and my uncle by marriage, Walter Seeley. It was an environment of culture, of learning, and hard work. Friends were treasured. Stone walls were built. Wood was gathered, sawn, and stacked against long winters. Food was canned. Meat was butchered and smoked, salted, or frozen. We were far more self-reliant then than now. Tony was always the artist, got the lessons, did the drawing, painting, creating. It took me a while to catch up. Eventually, the genes will tell, or in the words of the Yankee wit, an apple don't drop far from the tree. We became the fourth generation in the last five of my mother's family to become intrigued with metal, I as a smith, and Tony with lost wax castings. On leaving teaching, my sister had this to say, you're going to do what? But how wonderful to combine my love of history with a craft that stretches back eight or nine millennia. I had the discipline of wanting to learn, and so I did my piecemeal apprenticeship to learn the language of my craft. I began to collect useless equipment, a chimney that would draw properly, and then all the tools of the trade. And those that I could not find and needed, I made, until now I have hundreds, if not thousands, stashed around my shop. And sometime in the spring of 1974, I did my first craft fair on the streets of Greenfield, Massachusetts. When I was starting out, it was really hard to get all my deer in a row. There was so much to learn, and seemingly all at once. And then in the middle of the night, I would awake in a cold sweat. Am I really on the right track? This is my eighth and I trust final forge or smithy. My tools are conveniently around. I have retrained my body to act often by instinct rather than by thinking each move. I have had perforce to learn not only the craft, but the ancillary necessities of drawing and designing, of marketing, of bookkeeping. There were two skills I did not know about when I started. Learning to listen, Although I learned this from my Native American students, I did not see how it applied to smithing. And learning to see, which I think now a lifelong task, and then to convey that seeing to an audience, and to hear, however faintly, what the audience does indeed see. I started late enough in life so that I knew I wanted to create large architectural pieces, gates and balconies but one does not start there. My early years were spent learning the skills of classical European ironwork, creating house jewelry, training my hands to link with my heart and head. and bitter lesson, learning that the vicissitudes of a craftsman include having work stolen by a prominent decorator in DC. A lot of the early years felt as though I was simply being blown in the wind, much as I was as a teenager and in the early years of college, or bedeviled by mists creeping into the swales of my life. And then, in a flash, Often like this, in the dark of night, an image, an idea appears in three dimensions, and I am off running again. The request is for andirons for a large fireplace, and they are collectors of the great French smith, Edgar Brandt. A favorite motif of his was the cobra, so why not make them life-size? So here are Kai and Nagaina, or a decorative and fanciful fire screen. and another. Or a tree with lights. 
and a guardian dragon to entertain and protect the children of the family. Or a series of masks from the early 1990s. The Great Bull Mask, number one. Over the years, I've done a lot of work for churches. This was a design from Reveille Methodist in Richmond. And here's the cresting. And in 1986, the call that any Smith would die for from the clerk of the works of the Washington National Cathedral would I be interested in designing and creating three gates for the burial chambers? This was my first design and still one of my favorites, but far too open for the cathedral. And so we went on to the brown gate. And in 1994, the Folger gate. And some details. And still I am learning to look and to see. God may well hide in the details, but so too does mystery and wonder and inspiration. Margaret Wildenhain said, the ability of an artist to see and then to convey what he sees is the very basis of an artist's being. So here, Carl Blosfeld undertook his examination of nature in the 1920s by magnifying a nature 10, 20, 30 times, revealing new worlds for exploration in iron. Or a moss world. A butterfly's world. And last year's Japanese maple leaf. Matched vases forged from black iron water pipe. A heart box for Susan, complete with a golden pearl. And bookends in the manner of Edgar Brandt. But I did move on to larger pieces the stairway of a private art museum in Rhode Island. A self-closing logier gate set amongst the pines of the North Carolina landscape. A forged gate using naval brass for the Rockefeller Plantation in North Tarrytown, New York. And with leftover brass as a gift to my brother, a former diplomat, the George W. Bush Foreign Affairs Chariot that only traveled in one direction and on elliptical wheels. More classical ironwork. This for a non-classical house. And then some works around Rappahannock County where I live. The drawing which became this gate Detail one of the copper leaves. A railing separating the house from a pool. And a detail of one of the medallions. A love bench with our favorite Sasha. An art vein. And then finally, 
moving into sculpture, a commission called the Dancers. It need not lock, no hinges required, no code except aesthetics to adhere to, and what a relief. It's enough to make one jump for joy. One needs to have a human heart and a soul that is aflame for what one does, for doing this work, and perhaps any work, but for this work in the heat of summer and dark of night, it is too hard to do not to love it. But it also means that I'm cast back on myself for the ideas. No architects, no designers. It is when being a studio artist, as opposed to an art teacher or a university instructor or a grant getter, forces me inward to give time and space for the ideas to flow. As a change, I've tried a little stone carving in the winter. What did Janet Broom say? Keep yourself fresh. And thank the gods the ideas do spring forth. Here is West Wind, the idea from a children's book by Thornton Burgess, read first in my childhood. This is tabletop size. And it gave birth to Tornado, seven feet tall and eight feet long. Here forging the curve. Here threading the needle, or I've been told eroticism at its best. Often a maquette is needed to show the work. Here, just to illustrate a sculpture for a hospital wall, the leaves are four to seven inches tall, which grew to a pile of West Virginia leaves, eight feet tall and 10 feet across. And of course, inspiration. Here is raw, installed and wind blowed. I always try to take a camera with me. I'm looking for ideas. I'm still teaching my eye to see all that I am looking at. Here the imprint of a hawk after its prey, or imagining an otter frozen into ice, or God mimicking El Greco, or Nal mimicking El Greco, who is mimicking God. Meet Henri Sank, or Gregor. Smithing mythology demands that pieces be named, lest they return to haunt you in the dark of night. Here is Hobson's choice. Spirelli, after a piece by Fritz Kuhn. A perlicue. Hermione, Junior, Bottomley, Alphonse, and Georgiana. A pair of Rappahannock egrets. And playing off the title of one of Sam Keane's books, Dancing to a God. A candle stand. West three wind, seven feet tall and seven feet wide. Patterns. And still I have not yet completely told you how I arrived at these designs. They are, of course, born out of my 70-odd year experience on this earth. Books that I have read, libraries that I have searched, places that I have been, and dreams that I have had. Often they appear in the wee hours of the morning. The eastern sky begins to lighten. Elves and goblins, sprites and fairies look toward their bowers. The rational mind rejects all this, of course, and yet, when I walk our dirt and tree-lined road, 
star or moonlit. I would tell you that there are things moving in the woods, shapes to be seen, ideas to be gleaned, discovered, and finally brought to the light of day. They appear in dreams, for me in iron, iron that came with us from the sea when we crawled to the land, iron ochre that decorated our earliest pots and bodies, iron ore and the mysteries of smelt smelting that allowed us to cultivate <clears throat> the earth as well as subdue our neighbors. Iron that makes our blood red and gives color to the trees. <clears throat> Iron, strong and alive when hot. It is perhaps also the most indispensable of all elements, save the air we breathe and the water we drink. Without iron and the workers of iron through the millennia, our civilizations would be bereft. For me, personally, iron is in my peculiar and specific DNA. It is in my molecular memory. When I raise my hammer, Thor's hammer, my joyeuse, somewhere above me, hovering, are all the smiths of yore, Norazong, St. Eloy, and Edgar Brandt, as well as the metal workers of my especial family. Why iron? As if I had a choice. And so I leave you with the king and queen of blacksmith's tools and the motto of the London Company of Worshipful Blacksmiths. By hammer and hand, all arts do stand. Thank you.